So Steph and Roger, thank you guys both for joining me today on the Wilson Tennis blog to talk about our longest running racket franchise, the Wilson Pro Staff, the racket you guys both played with. That's right. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, my pleasure as well. Nice to be here. <laughs> All right. So as you guys know, we just, uh, we're, we're super excited because we just launched the 13th version of Pro Staff. Uh, you know, with this racket, we really wanted to make the best playing racket for the modern game uh, without losing that classic Pro Staff feel that the players love. Uh, until this latest version, we've, you know, outside of head size increases, we haven't really changed the racket much from the 1983 version. Um, and, and actually, Stefan, you started playing pro. I mean, you, you turned pro right around that time. Do you remember what, what racket you were using when you turned pro? Uh, well, absolutely. When we start from the beginning, I actually grew up playing with wood rackets. Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, we're playing with aluminum rackets. Um, <laughs> which was a huge change from the wood racket. Uh, but then, you know, in 1984, I believe, you know, I got three prototypes of the new pro staff at the time. Um, was a wonderful feeling right from the beginning. And, uh, you know, I started playing with it after having played with a Wilson Javelin for a year, which was, was another transition. Uh, good racket, but not close to what the pro staff did for me and uh, once I picked that, that racket up I got to the semi-final in Rotterdam and the following week I won my first ATP tournament in Milan uh, with the new pro staff so it was off to a flying start uh, it was it was great yeah that's awesome I, I saw pictures of that Wilson Javelin and I was looking up and it's got the throat with like the upside down V in it that's yes, kind of a absolutely. yeah kind of a crazy absolutely. looking racket but uh, it must have been pretty interesting to play at a time where there's so many different materials being used with wood, aluminum, graphite. You know, what was what was that kind of like playing against probably players using different materials out there? Uh, well, it was a great time, you know, back in the 80s where there was a lot of new rackets, uh, new materials, even, you know, big head sizes, uh, I think 100 square inches, maybe 105 from uh, from a brand. Um, there were a lot of changes going on um, and obviously maybe it wasn't so great for the racket industry when they went off from the woods because with the wood rackets they would break and you would buy new rackets. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the, the, the change um, that, that was made really made it a lot easier to play tennis as well. And uh, the technology has really progressed ever since. Yeah. So what was it about pro staff that, you know, obviously you, you played with it most of your pro career. So what was it about that racket that, that kind of stuck out to you? Uh, well, the, what it would have pro staff at the time, I mean, it was, was great control. Um, it was just a great feeling. You know, I felt where I hit the ball every time. And I tried to make some changing to a different racket at times in the beginning of my career I couldn't quite get the same feeling so I stuck with a pro staff throughout my career actually but thinking back I probably would have been better for me maybe towards the end of my career to try something new a new technology that would give me more speed because with the, with the, with the pro staff that I had you really needed to hit the racket you needed to hit it clean didn't get much help, uh, so that I do regret not getting into new technology towards the end of my career. That really probably would have helped me, especially with the speed that you get from the rackets as of today. Yeah, and uh, Roger, you turned pro right around the time that you know just after uh, Stefan retired. Uh, but you were playing with, I, I believe, the same racket uh, as what he was playing with. Do you remember the first time you played with a pro staff racket? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember maybe the exact first uh, time I ever hit with it, but uh, I do remember, you know, I, I played with the the racket with the American flag. Uh, I don't know what it was actually called. Jim Courier, I think, uh, played with it for a little while. And then I played with that one, but then Wilson had told me they had stopped play using it. And I think it was also an 85 square inch, and they also had, I think, a 95. And I used the 85, and I loved it. And then for me, the natural choice was the Pro Staff 85, the midsize, the one that uh, uh, Stefan used and also Sampras used, you know, and both were my heroes. So I just had to get, get you know, sort of big enough and strong enough to use it because at 14, you would think it's still a little bit too heavy. I think nowadays, no 14-year-old would probably switch to a racket like this. 
But the thing is also, I had just moved to the National Tennis Center and we were playing on Supreme Court, which Stefan must have loved in his day. You know, it was super <laughs> yes, fast. Sure. And, and you needed a, 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 like a heavy racket to be able to counter all the power and pace coming from the other player. And this is then when I, I guess I switched to it probably like around 95, like 94, 95 and played with it all the way to 2002, I remember. And that's when I then switched to the, you know, the pro staff 90 that we then created together with, uh, with Wilson. But it was a good time. Like Stefan said, of course, it was some, some mishits and it was hard, you know, when he didn't hit, <laughs> hit the ball cleanly. But my boy, when, when you hit it cleanly, it was really a, a perfect racket. And I think it was also very much built for attacking tennis, at the, to be honest, and not for the longest of baseline rallies because eventually you would catch it a little bit on the frame. But uh, I was happy I played with uh, Stefan and Pete's racket, even though I heard mine was not exactly identical to theirs. You know, if you look at the design, there are yeah. some elements that are different from Stefan's to, to mine. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing if you think about the pro staff. There's at least four number ones that played with a racket. You, Roger, you got Sampras, you got Curry, you got myself. Basically right. the same racket. And uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, Roger, in the same way that it was the, the Edberg racket and then the Sampras racket, it, it very much now is, is the Federer racket, right? Uh, you know, you've played with it all this time and you've had like unbelievable results, obviously. Uh, what is it about the racket that you think suits your game? Well, I mean, I'm mean, number one. I'm very proud, you know, to to be continuing the, in the pro staff era, in the line, in the footsteps of Stefan and Jim and Pete. Uh, for me, that has been something. Uh, um, I don't know. It just makes me very happy, you know. I played Wilson my my entire career. Like Stefan, also I played with uh, wooden rackets at the very very beginning and the white tennis balls in the time a very <laughs> short while, and then things changed very quickly for me. Um, but, you know, I, I really also thought it was important to change some of the features of the racket, you know, uh, like I mentioned in 2002 when I went to the bigger head size and then in 14 when I went to the 97, the RF 97 autograph, you know, and to have my own racket today is a, is a beautiful thing. But I really hope also it's great for, for uh, you know, the pro star franchise, for Wilson in general, and especially at the end of the day for the fans and all the other kids and players, uh, you know, choosing that racket. Because I want it to be a great racket, not just for myself, but for everybody else. And of course, it's, uh, I never thought I was going to have this kind of a career when I was young. And uh, to have done it all in, in the pro staff line has it's been very nice for me. Yeah, so before we talk about some of those adjustments that you made to pro staff over the years, uh, did you ever test any other Wilson rackets or was it just like, no, this is, this is the one? Um, I, had, I didn't uh, test uh, a lot of rackets for a long time, you know. Um, it, it's hard to, to keep on testing and trying if you're actually happy with one thing, you know. Don't uh, fix something that's not broken, right? So uh, for me, um, I don't think I've tested anything really until 2001, 2002, because I really start to feel like, okay, this is a, a changing of the string and I switched to the hybrid string, you know, the half gut, half Luxalon. I think that was a really important step for me. As I was changing racket, I said, well, how about if we also change string or at least really go into some serious testing. I remember uh, doing that with uh, Peter Carter as well at the time. And then... Uh, I went through the entire phase of 2002 to 2014, pretty much playing with the same racket with some minor adjustments, you know, um, in technology, but it was more subtle. And then I really had the, the urgency when I had ba a bad back in 13, uh, you know, to really go test out uh, what else is out there with Wilson, you know, and they always wanted to give me the latest technology and all that stuff. And I think especially since uh, 13 or 12, I started to test more and more things and rackets and technology and um, et cetera. And then the latest one I tested was the Clash, to be honest, you know. Um, that was a, a totally different kind of racket. Uh, maybe not built for Stefan and me yet. We still like to play with maybe more in the pro staff line, you know. But the Clash, I think, is a highly interesting racket when you think about it, like having the trampoline effect and just the way it feels. I would uh, definitely need to configure it to, to, my, uh, to my spec, if you like, because I'm so used to, you know, my, my type of racket. But I think maybe once I'm retired, I could switch to something like the Clash, even though nostalgically, I will always stay with the pro staff, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I totally agree with Roger. I, I tried this clash once, and wow, it was uh, it was like a trampoline, uh, hard yeah. control at the beginning. Uh, so that was really a change. And and since you mentioned about strings, you know, with a hybrid laxalon, 
that's really made a big change to to tennis as well because um, you know in, in the past I used to play with natural gut and you, you yeah. could use nylon so you had to choose either control or speed or yes or power, power. But now, nowadays, you know, with the strings you play up today, you both have the control and the power at the same time. So, um, you know, when I play tennis today, it's uh, it's far easier to to get the power and the control of the ball. So, how, how is your string today, Stefan? What do you? Uh, well, I use nat I use natural gut uh, on the long okay. on the long line, and uh, then I have the the laxalon on 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 the cross. The other okay. way around, yeah, across. So, um, okay. that, that it works well for me. And and in the yeah. past. You know, my my strings would break within you know, maybe two hours. Today, yeah. with this pattern, I can play twenty hours, twenty five hours with the same stringing pattern. In You're gonna add some top spin to your forehand, Stefan. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I couldn't do in the past, not very well. And what racket do you use? Do you use uh, the RF ninety seven or you use a different? Oh one? yes, I, yes, I do. Yeah, I've done. That. Oh, you still yeah. do? Okay. I actually, I actually made a change. At oh, the same come on. Time, you made a change for me. It took another 50 years to make the change, basically. <laughs> but uh, it, it was a great change. It took some time. And, and, and looking at back at, at the time when we, you know, I, I was with you for two years on the, on the tour, you know, you switched the racket in, was it yeah, 13, 14? 14. Yeah. It's probably pro one of the wisest things you ever did to actually <laughs> switch that. Uh, because you know, Thank playing you. with the old pro staff, it, it wouldn't have been the same. So uh, it was mm. it was a good move, and, and I think that really helped you. You know, until where, where, where did you, you think the biggest right change for me? Uh, where do you think the the RF ninety seven helped me in my game? You said it was an important change. I agree, but where yeah. do you see it the most? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you can get more speed with it. Uh, I think it would help you a little bit in the server, especially on the back end. I think with the back end, that really yeah. made the biggest change. Uh, but it makes it a lot easier to, to hit it. Um, and yeah. that's maybe where you needed the help was on the backhand side four, and you can yeah. wake up in the middle of the night, hit it as hard as you can, wherever you want to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, was, I was actually gonna ask, uh, you know, you switched to that rack or you started play testing the, uh, the 97 right around the time that Stefan started coaching you. Did he have yeah. anything to do with that? Or did you start testing that racket before you guys started working together? Uh, I think I was working on the racket before in 13 when I had the bat back and it gave me some time to test rackets and I did and then I played with a demo version through the summer of 13 in Gstaad and Hamburg and was going to play in Cincinnati with it but I, I just figured like there was so much things going on with my game at the time I, so I switched back, I got cold feet and went back to the, <laughs> the, the, the 90 and played the, I believe the rest of the season with it. And then in the off season, I went back to test and actually made some adjustments to that racket I played in the summer of 13 with, and then played uh, 14 uh, uh, with the, the RF 97, as we know it sort of today. And then Stefan, I don't know when we started working together, was it? Uh, yeah, it was, that was the end of 13. I came to Dubai and we spent a week there. Okay. And, uh, so, I, I, so Stefan was part of the testing, I guess, you know, um, and that, that was interesting, but I think, he, he was the first to tell me, and I think a lot has to do when I think a player works with a coach's confidence as, you, as well. And I think when somebody like Stefan tells me, you're doing the right thing, and I played with the 85, so I could totally relate to it. And he says, it's a good switch going to that one because I do believe you need a little bit on power. You need a little bit on the back end. And, you know, the volleys and the slice and the forehand is there anyways. You know that. And we're going to work on tactical things, you know, if we work together. I think the confidence to be able to switch rackets uh, is very important and was very important for me. So it was great having Stefan around in that time. Yeah, Stefan, I was curious what you thought of the, of the head size switch, you know, when you first started, I mean, you came right on and, and he's, you know, mm -hmm. testing rackets and things like that. I was curious if you were thinking more about, you know, his game or his equipment or both or what the kind of mix was. Um, well, well, I, I guess um, you know, coming to Dubai, yeah, spending a week together was was, was great, just yes, to get to know each other, and um, you know, switching racket was was a big part of the success going forward. I think coming out of uh, 2013 with a bad back, uh, that was a good thing. So it's almost like a new start in 2014 for Roger with yeah. a, with a back that was in better order with a new racket. Um, and I was part of his team uh, together with Severin, um, so so it was maybe maybe some positive energy for Roger, I would imagine, um, to, to to start from the beginning and build and build to to win more in the future. Yeah, 
No, absolutely. I think it really infused me with uh, some some new energy because uh, 13 was a tough year. Uh, like uh, Stefan said, I really had to battle through that year. Uh, but then I think the new racket and having, uh, you know, my hero, you know, alongside me, you know, spending almost breakfast, lunch and dinners with and then looking up in the player box and seeing him fist pumping and saying, let's go, Roger. I mean, that was super inspiring. And so I, I still look back at those two years as being very, very special for me in my career, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you Who for you doing it. From, <laughs> you're my hero now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Stefan, you you won the. Uh, I, I was looking, and you know, you won the Australian Open in '85 and '87, and then you won Wimbledon in '88 and '90, and you won the sure. U.S. Open '91, '92. So it was very like you know, kind of segmented. I was curious, yeah. were you like really focusing on training for hard court? in some of these years and then you're like okay now i'm gonna really focus on grass it didn't just kind of work out that way um well i think it worked out the way it is i you know looking back uh, i was in maybe a little different situation from the players as of today because basically from 1984 i was in six davis cup finals so my seasons was from january to december so it was just keeping going non-stop and uh, you know you always try to to sort of try to peak a little bit at the Grand Slams but at the time you know I just kept playing and kept putting in energy to win every slam but obviously I didn't succeed uh, everywhere but it just turned out that I started winning my first Grand Slams on grass. Grass was always good to me. Um, you know I went on the hard court. Clay was different for me. It was tough but uh, it, by the end you know I felt really most comfortable even on the hard court towards the end because it's it's a very true surface in many ways where it's clean bounces you, you can get a grip with your foot and uh, it, it's a great surface to play on but I still love playing on the grass but it's a little bit more hard work uh, uh, playing on the grass yeah between you know between the two of you you have 10 Wimbledons and then you have eight Australian Opens seven US Opens one Roland Garros so and obviously we throw Pete Sampras in there. We get a lot more grass, some hard oh, yeah. court, not okay. very many Roland Garros <laughs> tournaments. So the question is, is a specific racket good for like a specific surface or is it more of the playing style or is it kind of a mix? I would say it's probably a lot to do with playing styles as well. I mean, I think the more spin you have, the probably the bigger the racket head you need, you know, and then I think it also you can... Uh, uh, mess around a little bit with what string you use, you know, and then of course, uh, I you know I do think uh, racket head size and the type of uh, frame you use uh, is good for different um, uh, surfaces. Now, I think it's also in your DNA. If you're an attacking player, you know you will always be at heart an attacking player. You will never become a defensive player, and it's just the other same around. If you're a counter puncher, it's uh, you have to really push yourself to be an offensive player, you know, and I think we've seen a lot of players do that actually uh, in the game nowadays. They really have found a way to be much more aggressive on faster surfaces, you know, and um, I think the racket has a big role to play. And I think maybe you see uh, if you go to faster courts or hard courts, I think how good the pro staff is, but maybe on clay, there is a different uh, racket you can use from Wilson, you know, that maybe would help you a little bit more for the clay. But I think the RF 97 nowadays is essentially also a great clay court racket. Yeah, you know, it, it's definitely apparent that the baseline style has become like such a dominant part of professional tennis. And obviously, both of you guys were, you know, big serving volleyers, uh, still are. Uh, you know, so do you think, um, like, the, like, what's the future of the serving volley strategy? Do you guys think there's a place for it? Is it just now and then? Do you think there's a pro player that can come along that does it as often as, as you did, Stefan, and, and have success with it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, the seven ball is always is going to be beneficial part of your game uh, going forward. I think there's all, you know, in my days and even in the 70s, there, there was a lot of guys playing serve and volley. It was good at the time. And looking back, yeah, I managed to play serve and volley a lot. Uh, but looking back, maybe I shouldn't have played as much as serve and volley that I did because it was too predictable. Uh, and then if you look at the game, how it changed at one time, everybody was playing from the back of the court. But I think there's been some changes over the, the last couple of years where actually the players have developed, um, you know, with their strategy 
they are coming to the net more often. They, they use, you know, they step into the baseline. They take, try to take shots from the point to try to get into the net. Um, yeah, so there are going to be some changes. I think in the future for being the number one, you're going to need to be able to do everything to play some volley once in a while. You need to be able to defend on the back of the court and you need to be very, very all round. And I think a lot of the players, the best ones are today. And um, so there, there'll still be room for serve and volley, but it's never going to be like it was 20, 25, 30 years ago. That's what I believe. Uh, but it's nice to have that sort of uh, in tennis where you have different sort of kind of players playing a different kind of game. That's, that's always the best tennis to watch, at least for me. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would completely agree with uh, Stefan. Everything that he said, you know, uh, the top guys, everybody who's maybe not a certain volley, but they all uh, volley extremely well. You know, if you look at the top ten guys, they all know how to be comfortable at net. That's why they are ranked ranked where they are because they know against the best players in the world. If you do not move forward, eventually. Uh, the other guy will do it and find their way uh, into the point and then uh, you're going to be struggling and in defense and you can only get out of defense that many times. Now, talking about Serb and Volley, I, I think there's a couple of things to uh, to say who's going to have an, um, an impact on the players in the future and I think that, well, number one, it's the coach and I hope that a lot of coaches watching this video are actually going to think about how to progress their player at the net as well and not just about the baseline. I think maybe Stefan can also talk about how he used to train over one hour session, how much was at net. I think it will be probably completely different that time than today. But today, I think we don't spend nearly enough time at the net. You know, if I look at all the players' training, I see points played from the baseline, I see baseline rallies, I see drills, and everything's pretty much based at the, at the baseline. So I think certain volley then comes with that and, and certain volley is also a, a way it's a mindset you know you have to be able to come to net and accept to be passed but you're gonna you gotta keep on coming and you break your opponent down and you shrink the court i think essentially that's what a a great uh, um a certain volley player like stefan did or what i tried to do by coming to the net in different types of ways and then the other one i think for the tournament directors watching this, they have a big impact on how the game is going to go. Because if all the tournament directors are going to say, we want it slow, then forget about having certain volley players. If you want faster, fa uh, like certain volley game again, you need to speed up the court. And I think some have done it. And I think it would be nice to have more variety in speeds. I'm not saying I want fast all across the board, but I think having some really fast, some very slow, and seeing the players adapt to it, I think that's the beauty for every fan. I think you got a good point, uh, Roger, as well. And if, if you're going to be a good serve and volley player, at least play at the net and volley, it's, yeah, you need to spend more time in practice, but you actually need to do it playing matches when you're younger yes. too, uh, especially, you know, 14, 15, 16, because, you know, playing from the back of the court until you're 19, 20, and then decide you're going to be a good uh, volley or a serve and volley player, that is far more difficult. So it needs to sort of be done at the younger age uh, where you sort of get it into your backbone and maybe one more thing to add here which came to my mind uh, like you said i think i mean who cares about the results when you're 14 16 or 18 almost you know to some extent i know that it's important to fuel your uh, energy and your motivation for practice because losing just is not a great feeling so of course you're going to at the end in matches play to win i understand that but if you can add some serve ball if you can add some hit and volley, chip and charge and all that stuff, you know, of a return as well. I mean, all that stuff is, is going to benefit you later. Now, one more important angle is, and this is where maybe Stefan can also add something, back in his day, and he was number one in doubles too, certain volley in doubles was a must. If you stayed back, I don't think probably Stefan stayed back once in doubles when he played on the tour. <laughs> and uh, I, I only did it to see how it feels because other guys did it so effectively and so, so well that I do believe, even though that nowadays the doubles in the juniors or at the pro level are played a lot from the baseline, if you're a junior, I think use the doubles to serve and volley. Because if you're not going to serve and volley even in the doubles, I mean, sure, you're going to learn some things from doubles, but you will not never benefit as much as like I did when I played serve and volley from, I don't know, 16 years old all the way till 25 when I played only serve and volley on you know first and second serve in, in doubles N later on I tried the other way as well just to to see how it feels and I never, was never 100% comfortable but I think that's also one thing I find quite important we agree on a lot of things <laughs>
We do. <laughs> but it, for us, it's logical. <laughs> well, yeah, well it's, let's see. Let's see if you guys agree on this. How much time in practice should be spent on the saber? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can go first i can go first so the saber the saber the problem is like it's hard it's impossible to practice with other players uh, because it's so like it just doesn't feel right to do it in practice and break down uh, points that way even though it, it's a completely a legitimate tactic you know to be honest uh, like certain volleys or standing way back in the court who thought that that was normal, you know, like in Stefan's day that a guy would be returning in the back fence, you know. So the Sabre is the other version. This is super extreme. But I think the Sabre, to practice that one, you need somebody to serve it to you and you keep on practicing it that way one after another. Because I don't think you, it's very hard to play points and that's why it's been hard for me to, to <laughs> keep the Sabre up, to be honest, in matches. But I'm already thinking, how can I bring it back next year? So that's definitely yeah. in, the, in the makings <laughs> and in the plan. <laughs> Yeah, I was curious if that, uh, if that, if you came up with that, or if if that was. Uh... <laughs> well, I think I had nothing to do with. I nothing watched it when, when Roddy did first time in Cincinnati, and I think I was uh, sort of uh, semi shocked. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, it was something that was really exciting, something that was new, and sometimes you need to bring new things into the game. So at the time, it was it was fabulous. I've never done anything like that. Uh, maybe do put a half saber when I attack the net on the second serve, but nothing close. Yeah, sure did. And and I, I think practicing on the saber, you know, it's it's so difficult. Not many people are going to be able to do it. Not even if you practice your whole life, because it's all about timing and being strong enough. And uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a shot. Yeah, and you have to accept looking ridiculous, you know, if you miss it, because it looks like why you just throw away that point, you know. But if yeah. you make it, it, it leaves an impact on, well, he could be doing the next time or during an important point or he has got something up his sleeve maybe now, you know. Uh, for me, uh, when I tried it, you know, uh, I remember Severin telling me in Cincinnati, why didn't you take the return earlier? I think it was with Bernard Per, actually, if I remember correctly. In Cincinnati. <laughs> I, ju I just arrived and it was a super loose practice. And uh, I was tired. I just arrived from Switzerland. And, um, and I did it, I remember. And I, I took the ball early. He goes, no, no, but I'm saying earlier. You know, you got to step in the corner. I was like, oh, how early do you want me to take the ball? I cannot take it earlier than I am already taking, I thought. But Seven really wanted me to take it much earlier. So I said, like, what, like this? And I did the Sabre, you know? And he's like, yeah. well, not like that. But I think, I wonder <laughs> if the first or second one, like, literally worked to perfection, you know? And then we played... Um, uh, I think some games has been run. It was like super relaxed and mellow practice. And I did a few of the saves. I literally hit them for a winner. And I could not believe <laughs> that I was able to do it. Stefan, uh, sorry, uh, Severin was laughing. And Bernard Perry, he was like, are you, are you kidding me right now? What is going on? <laughs> it, was so, it was hilarious. And I think this is then how sort of the, the saber came alive. And then I also started using, I think, that week then in the, in the matches too. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I remember I was actually uh, I was in the stands watching your match against oh, really? a against Anderson, and you okay, hit yeah, you hit you hit the saber, you come into the net, and you finish the point. I think you had to hit two overheads. Two overheads, yeah. Yeah, and the ball goes in the stands, and I actually got that ball. So no chance. A oh. few people, few people, you know, fumbled with it. They kind of choked, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I ended up I ended up getting it. So that was yeah, that was kind of funny. Yeah, that's, that was, good. that's good. That was funny. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like the underhand serve. If it works, it's great. Yeah, but, uh... there you go. It's allowed. It's as yep. long as you're allowed to do it, it's okay. Just don't be scared of looking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, funny. So just a couple more questions about rackets before we we wrap this up for you guys. Uh, one of the questions we were we were interested in: Do you guys hang on to any of your rackets, like any of your rackets that you know you won a grand slam with, or something that's got like a special memory? You guys have like a room in your house where you get a bunch of rackets hanging on the wall, or? <laughs> well, if if I can start, you, you know, I I packed all my prizes and um, and all my trophies when I moved from London in uh, was it twenty hundred back to Sweden. They're still pretty much unpacked, so I don't have any trophies or anything, or even not rackets. But I do keep them at home, uh, so I have um, a lot of the rackets that actually finished a match point win uh, when I won my first Wimbledon for instance mm -hmm. um, I keep that at home and I haven't played a shot with it since so it's, uh, <laughs> it's the same condition but the only thing that's changed is some of the st uh, strings are broken now and yes. I haven't played it. it just gets too old uh, mm -hmm. yeah so I, I keep keep some trophies and you know the records that I hit the match points with those are my trophies 
Yeah, yeah. No, same for me. I mean, I've kept uh, a lot of the rackets. I mean, I never thought I was going to have the career that I was going to have. So I didn't keep that much in the early days, you know, because I was just like, well, uh, it's, uh, there's hopefully many, much more to play for. We'll see what happens, you know. But then if you look back, the oldest stuff is always in a way the best stuff, you know, or from the most important moments, like Stefan said, like a, uh, a Wimbledon win or, a, you know, for the French Open win or whatever it may have been. Uh, but I definitely start keeping stuff, you know, ever since I started winning Grand Slams, you know. And uh, I kept a lot of rackets. My wife's a little bit why so many i mean it's okay to keep some but why so many it's like well you know there's going to be charities in the future and i can hang <laughs> on to my stuff and i it's not like i'm hoarding it all but i know that maybe down the road it could be a great gift or uh maybe it really means something or i can pass it down to my children probably they'll they'll, they'll put it chuck it to the side and put it in their cellar and it's going to go down generation who knows <laughs> who knows what but yeah. uh, i do have a lot of rackets you know so uh same for outfits as well and shoes and all that stuff i I try to keep as much as possible, but also very much so for charity because I know it's a, it always raises a lot of money for a good cause as well. Good. Now you must have a, quite a big collection by now. You've played for ages. <laughs> how, how, how many? Yeah, that's true. Also, how many rackets did you ha use per year, Stefan? Because uh, I use around you know fifty a year or so, mm -hmm. sixty maybe. Yeah, I probably use maybe half of that, around maybe okay. twenty-five rackets a year. I and you would travel with how many? Uh, usually 12. Okay, also batches of 12. Around, yeah, around for me. 12. Okay. And that's what I would do. And, uh, yeah, you would all, always have maybe five, six rackets that you sort of restring before the matches. You had some old rackets okay. as well. So you have exactly. different. So, yeah, you've got to keep a lot of rackets on court in case. Yeah, absolutely. You know, weather changes or the tension doesn't feel right. So it's it's quite important, at least for professional players, to have a lot of rackets on court. If you're an amateur, you maybe need one or two rackets. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for most players, you know, it's really exciting to, to get a new racket or, you know, get a new couple of rackets or something like that. You know, I still remember opening like rackets on Christmas and I get like three new ones and I'm like, ah, this is awesome. Uh, how, do, how do you guys feel when you get new rackets? Is it, does it still feel like that or is it kind of, you know, with 60 rackets a year, it's a, it's a lot of rackets. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it feels special for me. I mean, I remember, yeah, I mean, I know I, I get them usually in a box and they're all like got the bubble wrap around them and I pull them out and, you know, they're all freshly strung, new frame, new grip, the whole thing. Yes. I mean, it is a beautiful moment always, you know, uh, it's unfortunately not wrapped, you know, with the little bow on top, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's definitely cool. Now, are we talking about the new racket one during the year or are we talking about something like the RF-97 autograph, the new one coming out now? So, I mean, that's then very special. That's more, much more special, of course, when you have played with a certain um, cosmetic or design for a certain amount of time and then you change. Uh, that, to me, is always very exciting, nerve-wracking at the same time. And there you cannot just wait instead of just holding it you want to go out and hit balls with it you know because you were obviously doing you went through the testing and then now you want to see how it feels again when it's real and here is your batch of 12 rackets all freshly strong and ready to go yeah well um well it's it's uh, it's always exciting with a new racket and um, i actually received a new pro stuff three weeks ago here hey! I there it is there so it is pretty exciting. I can see you still got the little stripes here, red and yellow. It's yeah. a good technical yeah. detail. So I'm looking forward to have make the first hit with these rackets pretty soon. Okay. So it is, it right. is exciting, on. but then you get a new racket, new sort of new pro stuff. They don't come along that often. So That's right. it is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this one this one got me back. I switched to the clash for a couple of years there, but I'm I'm back. Uh, yeah. Are you? Nice. So, for sure. Well, then after this phone call, you got to be back on the pro staff. Oh, yeah, sure. I think. And I, I mean, I'm so I'm drinking the Kool Aid oh, over oh, here for oh, sure. Look at that t shirt. I got that shirt too, actually. I bought it. Yeah. In, I got it in a store. I saw it. And I was <laughs> like, oh my God, I need that shirt. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's so like, you know, we're all so excited about it because, yeah, honestly, the, the racket's great, but the history is so cool around pro staff. You know, no other racket franchise has this. Uh, if you just think of all the people that have played with pro staff, I mean, it has to be by far the most like grand slams won with any specific racket, right? Obviously you guys have written a lot of this history yourselves. Uh, do you guys have a favorite memory with, with pro staff or just, you know, within your career? 
It's a lot of good ones, so. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Somehow I got to almost go back to the 85 and I beat uh, Pete at Wimbledon. I know I always refer back to that match, but it was my first time on center court at Wimbledon. It's the only time I ever played against Pete. And we played with the same racket, essentially. Okay, he had like a much heavier version of it because he put all the lead tape on it. And he had the super tight stringing job, you know, with the very thin all gut string. I played once with his racket. Uh, um, once uh, his former stringer brought it to Davis Cup to, for me to hit with it. That was just something else, you know. But so for me to have that clash of the pro staffs, you know, the two of us playing against one another, I think, if I look as in a pro staff uh, world, uh, that would be it. If I would have played Stefan, that would have been another one. But unfortunately, that match <laughs> never happened. <laughs> yeah, and um, well, I probably would say, you know, um, back in 1984, I just picked up the Wii, the record three weeks uh, beforehand, winning my first ATP title uh, back in Milan. Um, I think that would be the moment, I think, because it was a new racket. Uh, it felt great. Won my first ATP tournament. Um, just a great feeling. Um, and at the time, I played with a prototype. It was all black. There was no design on it or anything. So um, just had three rackets uh, during that tournament in Milan. Oui. So whenever uh. I broke the racket, I had to go out to the stringer immediately. <laughs> Uh, so it was almost a panic sometimes if you break two strings, you know, you only have one racket to go. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so there's a good memory from 1984. And I believe maybe you won your first ATP tournament in Milan as well, Roger, is it? Yes, or, um, absolutely. No, no, yes. no, you're right. 2001, also a big deal for me, you know. Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, uh, the, talking about prototype and then being all black, that, that's what was the case for me in 13. And as we were then looking at for the evolution of the RF97 autograph, you know, um, the one that came out in 14, which was like black and red and with a little bit of yellow. Um, we then, I had in my mind, uh, how about if we made an all black racket, like one of those prototype rackets, because sure. I think uh, nowadays so many rackets have so many colors on them. So I said, how about if we reduce it to a very classic, crisp, stylish looking racket, you know, with details, but you have to look up close to it. Uh, and yeah. this is how I actually ended up with the very black, you know, pro staff today. It's actually also through a prototype, you know, it's funny you say that. Yeah, that's a good, because that's a really cool racket. I remember, remember when you showed it to me and I said, wow, this is a great racket, great looking because it's, yeah. it's so, and it's just black with a few details. So uh, yeah. Also, the, I think a very special, I mean, I don't know if everybody has already touched it, you know, but a feel obviously is very important for a player or you always hold the handle, mm -hmm. but the elastic paint, you know, I think is very, very special and very different to any uh, other racket out there on the market. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's nothing, uh, there's nothing cleaner than all black. That's for sure. It looks, <laughs> looks pretty sweet. That's for sure. Um, well, cool, guys. Hey, this, is, this has been really fun, really awesome talking with, uh, with both of you about pro staff. I appreciate you both taking the time during all this. Oh, it's my been pleasure. Fun. Absolutely. Thank you, Stefan. Awesome. That was good fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Roger. You did well. <laughs> you, thank you. Thank you. The master yeah. approves. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I think, that went, I think that went really well. It was great. Now, now the thing is, hopefully when I end this call, the file is there. And it's yeah, saved. Make sure you and save it. Okay? <laughs> save the file, Patrick. <laughs> yes, I did. I did a lot of testing before, so I'm. Oh, you oh, yeah. good. Fingers yeah. crossed, it should be okay. So yeah, right. but yeah, seriously. If, if you don't have it on your phone, we get you up at four o'clock in the morning tomorrow again. Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> oh man, awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. I really okay. appreciate it. That, that you, was Patrick. great. So. Okay. Stefan, right. enjoy your week. Send me some pictures, okay? Uh, yes, I will do. Yeah, uh, we have All a right. few on on file here. So um, oh, yeah, I know it's a great you. area here. I must say, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to go. So I'm very excited. So no, no, you, you're still you're still gonna play on the tour for another five years. <laughs> this is like after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, take uh, care, just, Stefan. All right. Say hi just to all the ladies as well. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. Bye, See guys. you guys. Thanks. Ciao. Ciao. See you. Bye.